Deuteronomy 33, reading there from verse 12. And of Benjamin he said, The beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him, and the Lord shall cover him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. Throughout these studies on the ceiling of the 144,000, we have learnt that to be among them does not mean perfection at first. We learnt that Perfection that they are described by is an end result of a purification process after which they are declared as perfect, sinless. We uh, read the scriptures on regards to this in James chapter 1 verses 2 through to four. James chapter one, verses two to four. <clears throat> My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. In the uh, message of the third angel, Here is the patience of the saints. Let patience have her perfect work because as we go through these trials of the last days and we count it all joy that we meet those trials and we are patient with them, we will become what? Perfect, entire, wanting nothing. That's a very, very uh, clear representation of perfection to be attained. It's entire. Nothing else needed. Absolute perfection. That's what this is about. And we read also in Jude on the same activity of, of uh, mind, Jude verse 20 and 21. But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And he completes it there in verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. So we are called upon to build up ourselves in the most holy faith, continuing to focus upon the love of God, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, to eternal life, which means he is going to keep us from falling to present us faultless. Our dependence is upon the mercy of God for this. And so here are a people 
who are going through a purging experience, through trials, as Zechariah really puts it neatly there in chapter 13 of Zechariah. <clears throat> Zechariah chapter 13, reading there verse 9. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried and they shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people and they shall say, the Lord is my God. If you and I want everlasting life, if we want to be saved at last, it is, especially in these last times, through the fire. Purification such as the refining of silver and gold. A fire. And so, when we read those words in Revelation chapter 7 verse 14, they come out of great tribulation, this 144,000. That is the trial of our faith that purges us. Verse 14, he said, These are they which came out of great tribulation. Not just tribulation great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Washing, fire, purification, this is all part of it, the trials of your faith. And so that's who they are and Revelation 14 puts it very clearly that there they are 14 verse 1, I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. In verse 5, in their mouth was found no guile for they are without fault before the throne of God. Here they are. And so it is that the spirit of prophecy clearly unfolds that to our mind here in the book Messages to Young People. Messages to Young People, reading there, page 73, and there in paragraph 3 it says, There are those who listen to the truth and are convinced that they have been living in opposition to Christ. How many times have people said this to me? Oh dear, I'm so far off the mark. I have been living in opposition to what has been shown me here. They are condemned and they repent of their transgressions relying upon the merits of Christ exercising true faith In him, they receive pardon for sin. As they cease to do evil and learn to do well, they grow in grace and in the knowledge of God. Can you see the progressive suggestion here? Relying upon the merits of Christ If you don't rely on his merits, you're never going to feel happy. He's going to make you feel accepted by his merits. They rely on the merits of Christ and exercise true faith in him and that's how they receive pardon. And they cease to do evil and learn to do well. And so they grow in grace. They see, they see that they must sacrifice in order to separate from the world. And after counting the cost, 
they look upon all as loss if they may but win Christ. They have enlisted in Christ's army. The warfare is before them and they enter it bravely and cheerfully fighting against their natural inclinations and selfish desires. Bringing the will into subjection to the will of Christ. Daily they seek the Lord for grace to obey him and they are strengthened and helped. This is true conversion in humble, grateful dependence. He who has been given a new heart relies upon the help of Christ. He reveals in his life the fruit of righteousness. He once loved himself. Worldly pleasure was his delight. Now his idol is dethroned and God reigns supreme. The sins he once loved, he now hates. Firmly and resolutely he follows in the path of holiness. What I have just read to you here is the course of each one of us to finally be a purified 144,000. The warfare is before us. And we are in it, in fact. And as it so beautifully explained here, that the, the dependence is totally on God. We've got a new heart because of conversion. And we no longer pursue the things that we once used to enjoy. The things we once loved are laid aside. Even the loving of myself and worldly pleasures, it's all dethroned. And this is a process, as we read it there, that they will learn to do well. Having read that as an introduction, we now go to an example of just that in the life of Benjamin. And it's good to examine the process by which God does this. What character deprivation took root in Benjamin's formative years. When he was born, what was it that triggered his life into a, a, a process of negativity? Well, we come here then to Genesis 35, verses 16 to 19. The beginning of his life as he was born and his formative years, the influence of his formative years. Genesis 35, 16 to 19. And they journeyed from Bethel and there was but a little way to come to Ephrata. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin and Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephratah, which is Bethlehem. 
well. What sort of a beginning of a life do we have, do we see here? Is there something wrong with this? We know that all the other sons were born with bickering parents and they had a poor start because of that. Here was somebody who, di- who, who was born to a mother that died at his birth and uh, it was, he was born to Rachel, which was Jacob's favourite wife. And of course now she dies and as before she dies at this birth she calls him Benoni. What does that mean? It means son of my sorrow. But Benjamin, I mean uh, Jacob called him Benjamin which means son of my old age. So this child is a, is a child that is surrounded by uh, influences of um, the, the sorrow and loss of his mother at birth and also a father who says, wow, now my son, this is the son of my old age. Uh, what, what is this? Is there something wrong here? To all observances, what's wrong with that? It's it's so okay, isn't it? Consider again the meaning of those names. The son of my sorrow. The son of my old age. Do you know children who are born to a catastrophic birth and especially to somebody who is getting on in years? What sort of, and especially to somebody who, who has a favourite wife in that situation there, and this son now, very special, yes? Well, what is the kind of result here of Benjamin's birth and his formative years. We go to a quote from the Patriarchs and Prophets to help us exercise our mind. We, it reads, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 230, paragraph 2. Here Judah is talking to Joseph because jo- Benjamin was going to be kept because the golden cup was found in Benjamin's bag. And now Judah really comes and pleads with the, the, his brother, whom he doesn't know it is his brother. Notice what is described about Benjamin here. It says, In words of touching eloquence, he described his father's grief at the loss of Joseph and his reluctance to let Benjamin come with them to Egypt as he was the only son left of his mother, Rachel, whom Jacob so dearly loved. Now therefore, he said, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is, his life is bound up in the lad's life, It shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us that he will die and thy servant shall bring down the grey hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave. What is the impact upon the life of Benjamin by a father like that? He is His life is wrapped up with his son. Can you imagine what transpires as he grew older from childhood in those formative years? We will continue to read this time from Testimony Volume 4 
page 200, paragraph 3. There it says, In many families, the seeds of vanity, selfishness, are sown in the hearts of the children almost during babyhood. This child, Benjamin, child of Jacob's old age, how would this child, with what kind of influence was this child Surrounded. What are the seeds that are sown into this child? Have you ever seen a doting parent over their child? Doting? Jacob would be a doting father. His life is wrapped up with this child. What kind of seeds would there be sown? It goes on to say, Their cunning little sayings and doings are commented upon and praised in their presence and repeated with exaggerations to others. A doting parent, proud of his little baby, proud of his his son, his, his dear son, special son. The child will be hearing of the father's doting appreciation of him. Yes? So what happens? The little ones take note of this and swell with self-importance. They presume to interrupt conversations and become forward and impudent. The child is listening and as it's listening to all the good things that is being said about it, the little child is picking up seeds of self-importance, pride swelling up within it. They presume to interrupt conversations because they're so important and become forward and impudent. Flattery and indulgence foster their vanity and willfulness until the youngest not unfrequently rules the whole family, father and mother included. Could this have been Benjamin's experience? It goes on to read, the dispositions formed by this sort of training cannot be laid aside as the child matures to riper judgment. Now, as the child grows into adulthood, it says, it grows with his growth and what might have appeared cunning in the baby becomes contemptible and wicked in the man or woman. They seek to rule over their associates and if any refuse to yield to their wishes, They consider themselves aggrieved and insulted. This is because they have been indulged to their injury in youth instead of being taught the self-denial necessary to bear the hardships and toils of life. Parents frequently pet and indulge their young children because it appears easier to manage them in that way to control and manage the child, indulge the child. It is smoother work to let them have their own way than to check the unruly inclinations that rise so strongly in their breasts. And a petted child, it's even stronger, yes? Yet this course is cowardly. It is a wicked thing thus to shirk responsibility for the time will come when these children whose unchecked inclinations have strengthened into absolute vices will bring reproach and disgrace upon themselves and their families. They go out into busy life unprepared for its temptations, not strong enough to endure perplexities and troubles. 
passionate, overbearing, undisciplined, they seek to bend others to their will and failing in this, consider themselves ill-used by the world and turn against it. The lessons of childhood, good or bad, are not learned in vain. Character is developed in youth for good or for evil. And so the, that whole page, that whole uh, description is something that is well worth reading. And um, we will examine to see whether these characteristics of childhood pride and passionate self-will actually is revealed in Benjamin as he gets on. And here we come to Genesis 49, verse 27, and we read something very interesting. As Jacob gave his accounts of his sons and blessed them. Genesis 49, reading there verse 27. Benjamin shall raven as a wolf or avenge as a wolf. Wow. Isn't that exactly what we were reading? It happened to Benjamin. He shall avenge as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey and at night he shall divide the spoil. There was something in him that developed that is what we were just reading from the spirit of prophecy. He would become quite a forceful personality because in childhood he was pampered. What else characterized the posterity of Benjamin? All his children, the posterity, and did not assist to pre prevent a baleful result. Because these, these children of Benjamin and the tribe of Benjamin had a particular quality about them as it is written here in Judges. And what, again, would have, would have an influence upon this tribe, upon this character? We come to Judges. Judges chapter 20. And we read there verses 15 and, and 16. Some characteristics of this tribe. Judges 20, verse 15 and 16. And the children of Benjamin were numbered at that time out of the cities, twenty and six thousand men that drew sword beside the inhabitants of Gibeah, which were numbered seven hundred chosen men. Among all these people, there were seven hundred chosen men left-handed Everyone could sling stones at an hair breadth and not miss. Are you aware of certain skills that you have and as you, as you are so good at that skill, what does it do to you? Hmm? They couldn't miss a hair's breadth. That's how smart they were. Then we read some more about them in uh, First Chronicles chapter 8. First Chronicles chapter 8, reading there verse 40. And the sons of Ulam were mighty men of valour, archers, and had many sons, and sons' sons, and 150. All these are the sons of Benjamin, men of valour, men of capability, and um, jumping across to chapter 12 of First Chronicles, again in verse 1 and 2. Now these are they that came to David to Siklag while he yet kept himself close because of the son of Saul, the son of Kish. And they were among the mighty men, helpers of the war. Mighty men, yes? They were armed with bows and could use both the right hand 
and the left in hurling stones and shooting arrows out of a bow, even as Saul's brethren of Benjamin. Very, very smart men, very skilled. And I ask the question again, what is the danger upon this kind of skilled people? With already the ingredient of a petted childhood background in their forefather. Let's come here to 1 Corinthians and let the Bible do the talking. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Very smart, very capable. What is the danger? We read it already in the spirit of prophecy, didn't we? They are so self-willed, so strong, so capable, um, proud, no doubt, again, and here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we read there in verse 1, from the last part of verse 1, it says, um, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 8, reading there, Verse 1, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But if a man love God, the same is known of him. So, what does the scripture tell us? What does knowledge, what does skill, what does all this do to you? It puffeth up. And so there are people who are so capable, so skillful and petted childhood background they think they know better than others, yes? They're capable, better than others. And there is a development in the natural sinful human nature that is self-explanatory here. We go back uh, to... 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 3 1 Samuel chapter 2 and there we read verse 3 1 Samuel 2 3 Talk no more so exceeding proudly Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed. Exceeding proud, arrogant. These are the consequences. And I know this very well. The German nature must be Benjaminite because they are skillful and they become very arrogant. Benjamin was of this kind of nature. Very arrogant, proud, speaking of their capabilities. So smart, you know. You, have you heard somebody skiting about how well they can aim at something and knock it off the perch, as it were? It swells up inside of you. You feel proud about it. Human skill. And in this present age in which we are living, there is something written in the spirit of prophecy here which truly tells us that the time in which we are living is very, very Serious, and I'm reading here from Councils on Health, page 367, CH 367, paragraph 1. What's our age like? It is a dangerous age for any man who has talents which can be of value in the work of God. What's this? Benjamin has talents. Very valuable. In the, in the warfare that they had to fight. They came to support David. They were so capable. In today's age, 
those people who have talents that can, can be valuable in the work of God, it's a dangerous age. Why? For Satan is constantly plying his temptations upon such a person, ever trying to fill him with pride and ambition. And when God would use him, in nine cases out of ten, he becomes independent, self-sufficient, and feels capable of standing alone. This is better than others. I can do it myself. Filled with pride, ambition. And what does it say? When God would use him, nine cases out of ten, he becomes independent, self-sufficient and capable of standing. Nine cases out of ten, that's the age in which we're living. This will be your danger, doctor such and such, unless you live a life of constant faith and prayer. You may have a deep and abiding sense of eternal things and that love for humanity which Christ has shown in his life. A close connection with heaven will give the right tone to your fidelity and will be the ground of your success. So there is counsel there given. But the the point of this quote is to help us realize that in the age in which we are living, the talents of capability, the skills, can actually, nine times out of ten, lead in the wrong direction even though these are talents that can be used for God's glory. We read once more, Testimony, Volume 4, 538, there in paragraph 1 again. Dangers beset every path, and he who comes off conqueror will indeed have a triumphant song to sing in the city of God. That's the 144,000. They will sing a triumphant song. Some have strong traits of character that will need to be constantly repressed. If they kept under the control of the Spirit of God, these traits will be a blessing. So good talents, capabilities. Was a good child just petted? And so these are the the influences, the seeds that will sprout into arrogance and pride and so on. Yet, those very same qualities can be blessed by God. Interesting. If those who are now riding upon the wave of popularity do not become giddy, it will be a miracle of mercy. If they learn to their own wisdom, as as so many thus situated have done, their wisdom will prove to be foolishness. But while they shall give themselves unselfishly to the work of God, never swerving in the least from principle, the Lord will throw about them the everlasting arm and will prove to them a mighty helper. Them that honour me, I will honour. So here we see the, the time in which we are living, the dangers that beset the people of God today is, are the dangers of if you have skill and if you have ability, that will set you on a path of of extreme danger to become proud, self-assertive, stand on my own, I don't need anybody, I can do it all myself. And these are strong traits of character that need to be constantly repressed. Constantly repressed. If kept under the control of the Spirit of God, these traits will be a blessing. 
Interesting, that. So here we have Benjamin with such an inheritance and let us just have a look to see how that inheritance has affected the tribe of Benjamin in the past. Everything we were reading there, can we pick up on it? Now let's see whether we can read what happened to Benjamin because those traits were revealing themselves in a negativity in his tribe. Judges again, chapter 20, reading there verse 4 and 5. We just have a quick overview here because we could read lots and lots of of quotes which um, will take our time away to come to the conclusion that we are looking for. But uh, we will pick it up here in Judges, chapter 20, in the tribe of Benjamin, with all their uh, capabilities. Judges 20, verses 4 and 5 says, And the Levite, the husband of the woman that was slain, answered and said, I came into Gibeah. Remember Gibeah was the Benjaminite area? that belongeth to Benjamin. Here it is. I came into Gibeah that belongeth to Benjamin, I and my concubine to lodge. And the men of Gibeah rose up against me and beset the house round about upon me by night and thought to have slain me and my concubine they have forced that she is dead. Cruel behaviour, lynched by the Benjaminites. Verse 12 to 14. And the tribes of Israel sent men through all the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What wickedness is this that is done among you? Now therefore deliver us the men, the children of Belial, which are in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and put away evil from Israel. So here comes the counsel from the rest of of Israel to these people. This was in the days of the judges before even King Saul came about. But now, as as the tribes came there to try and bring justice about, how did the Benjaminites react? But the children of Benjamin would not hearken to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. But the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together out of the cities unto Gibeah to go out to battle against the children of Israel. Can you see a full-blown condition of the Benjaminite attitude? Self-assertive, full of their own opinion, full of pride and and passionate as we were reading there, a, a, a petted child can become. So by this time they are men and this nature is coming forth. And what happens in verse 23? And the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until evening and asked counsel of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up again to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? And the Lord said, Go up against him. Whoa. So now they went up against their own brethren who were so cruel. We come to verse 46 at the end of the scene. So that all which fell that day of Benjamin were twenty and five thousand men that drew the sword. All these were men of valour. Twenty-five thousand slain. Because they would raise their their arrogant attitude against their own brethren when they were already proven that the thing that was done to the Levites' partner there was so cruel. But they said, no, we're not going to bend to any suggestion there. They were going to fight. So this is a cruel characteristic. As we read it there from Jacob's words that he would be avenging as a wolf. 
There it is. There was a perfect illustration of that. These cruel characteristics came to light in the life of King Saul. King Saul was a Benjaminite. And we see how he commenced in the beginning. To cut a long story short, I just draw your attention to 1 Samuel 9 when it was written there about King Saul when he was chosen to become a king that he was a very honourable man. 1 Samuel, reading there from chapter 9, very interesting um, description of this young man, but he had something in him that was, because of his great capability, that made him headstrong, as we were reading already. So, here in 1 Samuel 9, 17, And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold the man whom I spake to thee of, this same shall reign over my people. Verse 21, And Saul answered and said, Am not I a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? So he was chosen, Samuel pointed out, you are to be the one to rule, and he says, I'm a Benjaminite, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm too small, I'm too weak, etc., etc. Very good attitude, humble attitude. First uh, Samuel 10, verse 1, Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured upon his head and kissed him and said, It is not because the Lord hath anointed thee, is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? The Lord anointed him. Verse 9. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. Saul became a converted man. He became another man. He had a new heart. He needed that, didn't he? But did he have Benjaminite flesh? This is the interesting part now. As we look at him in 1 Samuel 15, verse 16 and 17, And here, very early in the place of King Saul, he showed himself already in a position of vulnerability according to his human Benjaminite self. In verse 16, Samuel says to him, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king of Israel. When thou wast little in thy own sight. But what was the problem with Benjamin people? They were so capable. They were... They had that ingredient of being a petted child. So now there was this pride arising and no longer was he in that attitude of humility. And very clearly verses 18 onward says, The Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them. You know the story how he was told to destroy entirely the nation of the Amalekites. But he decided to keep the king and some of the flock. The way he wriggled himself through all that was to show you that he had his own opinion against God's own word. And as a result, he lost his kingdom ultimately. But here in 1 Samuel 18.11, it says, And Saul cast the javelin, For he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. 
And David avoided out of his presence twice. And here you see the, 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 the passionate attitude of Benjamin coming through. This man, Saul, hated David, although he used to praise him for what he was. But he was, became jealous and envious. And he, he was cruel. He was going to kill David. Now, there is a condition inside of the Benjaminite people that we are to learn from that this is their problem, this is their condition, but God attempts to arrest them from this downward course. He is trying to save them among the 144,000, remember? So, to ensure that they could be, I want to read here then from Bible Commentary Volume 2 and see what the Spirit of Prophecy has to say in regards to this, what God wants to do to help people like Saul, like the Benjaminite mentality. This is Bible Commentary Volume 2, page 2000. Uh, sorry, page 1017 in paragraph 3. It says this. There are many whom God has called to positions in his work for the same reason that he called Saul. Because they are little in their own sight. Because they have a humble and teachable spirit. In his providence, he places them where they may learn of him. To all who will receive instruction, he will impart grace and wisdom. It is his purpose to bring them into so close a connection with himself that Satan shall have no opportunity to pervert their judgment or overpower their conscience. Because they've already got that in the flesh, haven't they? God is there to work with them. He will reveal to them their defects of character and bestow upon all who seek his aid strength to correct their errors. So what will God do? He will reveal the defects of the character. Even though he has chosen them to be his instruments, they have defects of character. They need to be corrected, and God is going to do that with them, like he was trying to do with Saul. Whatever may be man's besetting sin, whatever bitter or baleful passions struggle for the mastery, he may conquer if he will watch and war against them in the name and strength of Israel's helper. Can you see now here with what we were reading in the beginning is that the 144,000 and of the tribe of Benjamin, there is, there is a, this character defect that we have seen, a character defect of being smart, capable, and using it to boost up my own ego and be self-deceived um, about myself, pr- full of pride and, and uh, being arrogant and being passionate against somebody who doesn't agree with me. This character defect is there, but God wants to use that person. So what does he do? And when God does this to us, remember this story. It is his purpose to bring them into close connection with himself that Satan shall not have an opportunity to to pervert their judgment. He will reveal to them their defects. Don't expect a beautiful comfortable ride with God because he has chosen you to be among the 144,000. 
Don't expect something to be smooth and easy. We've already introduced our meditation on that. Here it is. How, what will he do? He will reveal your defects of character and bestow upon you all, sorry, and, and bestow upon all who seek his aid strength to correct their errors. So as he shows us our defects, we are to let him reveal them to us and give us strength to meet it. Whatever may be the man's besetting sin, whatever bitter or baleful passions struggle for the mastery, he may conquer if he will watch and war against them in the name and strength of Israel's helper. The children of God would cultivate a keen sensitiveness to sin. Sensitiveness, keen to sin. Here as well as elsewhere, we should not despise the day of small things. It is one of Satan's most successful devices to lead men to commission of little sins and blind the mind to the danger of little indulgences, little digressions from the plainly stated requirement of God. Can you see it there with Saul? A little digression. Just a little one. Not to do exactly what God is saying. That's what Satan wants and that's what God wants us to conquer. Many who would shrink with horror from some great transgression are led to look upon sin in little matters as of trifling consequences. But these little sins eat out the life of godliness in the soul. These trifling things eat out godliness. The feet which enter upon a path diverging from the right way are tending toward the broad road that ends in death. That's what happened to Saul, wasn't it? And I often marvel at Saul in contrast to David. Did Saul do great evils? In contrast to David, David did something far more serious. But Saul's sins were so small that they were eating out his godliness so that ultimately he lost his kingdom and he lost his life. But we want to conclude with another Saul from Benjamin by which we can see that that characteristic of cruelty of smartness, of capability, was conquered. And it's beautifully put here in the story of Acts. Acts chapter 8, verse 3. <clears throat> Acts chapter 8, verse 3. Here we have a Benjaminite with Benjamin cruelty. <clears throat> As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women committed and committed them to prison. This was Saul. Verse nine, chapter 9, verse 1 to 6. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter, against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And so you know the story, how he was out there to get the the people of Damascus. And as he journeyed, he came face to face with Jesus. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying, verse 4, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? 
And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So here is this cruel man, full of, full of himself, going to do the damage to the church, and God wanted to stop him. Now, observe his pride and skill turned into something better. Let's have a look what God did with him through the power of the gospel. That can happen to us as well. Philippians chapter 3. Here is the full description of the, of the change that took place in this Benjaminite. That is uh, Philippians chapter 3. <clears throat> Philippians 3, verses 4 to 7. I love this statement. For we are the circumcision which worship God in, in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. He was a Benjaminite. According to the flesh, he was just like a Benjaminite. But he says here, through Jesus, we don't go, go by that. Here he now describes it. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, in, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Right? Here's Benjamin speaking. I'm the best. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. I'm the best. Benjamin. Full of arrogance. And with such a strong flesh, with all its strong overtures and passions that he demonstrated as a cruel persecutor of God's people. What happens? What happens here? But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of a Benjaminite pride, loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Now, this person, having become a thorough Christian, a heart that has changed, look at what he says he has to do every day. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 26 and 27. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Remember we were reading that, we were to enter into the war against these characteristics. Here it is. What does he do? But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. The Benjaminite had a battle to fight. The strong flesh, according to the flesh, according to the flesh, he was the greatest, but he made himself of no reputation. He kept under his body, he controlled, he brought his body under subjection, which is those strong passions of the flesh. And as he did this, you know the description that was given when he was dying. He said, I have fought the good fight. 
I have gained the victory. So, can a Benjaminite with such powerful fleshly passions be among the 144,000? Whatever passions arise inside of you, never think, I'm not going to make it. I can conquer like, like Saul, Paul. And look at that beautiful scripture reading that we had. What a beautiful, victorious description is given here of the Benjaminite. It was Deuteronomy 33. So whatever passions there are, ever so strong, here is a wonderful hope in regards to the Benjaminite tribe. Deuteronomy 33, verse 12. And of Benjamin he said, The beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him, and the Lord shall cover him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. I love that statement. God shall dwell between Benjamin's shoulders. What is between your shoulders? If you, if you turn around there between your shoulders, right through is the heart. He will dwell between his shoulders. He will dwell in his heart. That's what happened to, to Saul Paul, Apostle Paul. The Lord dwelt in his heart. And this is possible for all who have these characteristics of Benjamin, strong, passionate urges that have been installed by a petted child or by skill and capabilities. You know, are you a perfectionist? Very perfectionist, very skillful in all you do. And you can see yourself, you can see all the wrongs that other people are doing around you. Hmm? Because you're so astute, so smart. These are all the characteristics that God can change by his wonderful mercy. And these people, Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, are recorded as a people of the 144,000 as well as all the other tribes. And we read it there in Revelation chapter 7, verse 8. There he is. There is Benjamin, the overcomer, like they, like um, Paul. In verse 8 there, the very last one. Of the tribe of Benjamin, there were sealed 12,000. That's a lot of people, 12,000. Of a, of, a, of a tribe that was so cruel that wouldn't even listen to their brethren to correct their wrong. So here we have the final tribe with all the other tribes that we have studied. And may God give us courage as we study these experiences so that whatever we meet that we can identify within these tribes we can know this does not have to destroy me. And so our concluding divine service will be a summary of the, everything we have studied when we gather again next Sabbath. Until that time, may the Lord bless these thoughts to us that we will be people who will be like 